Hi everyone, I'm Chauncey Nebula, and today let's talk about why Blood and Plunder might be the best historical miniatures game. Now, we already talked about should you play Blood and Plunder, and we gave five reasons for and five reasons against Blood and Plunder, or really more five pros and five cons. This video is talking about three reasons why Blood and Plunder is perhaps better than every other historical miniatures game. Now, whether it's actually better is really going to be up to individual tastes and preferences, but these are three things that I think set Blood and Plunder kind of above and beyond what a lot of other games offer. First of all, army size. Blood and Plunder has this very nice kind of medium between being kind of a warband skirmish game and an army game. It's not necessarily either of those things, because you can do either a small warband, you know, a very small pirate crew or something, or a lot of models, but the game seems to function best sort of in the middle. I've played games of Blood and Plunder where the game's been fantastic and I've only had 20 models. And then I've played games of Blood and Plunder where I've had 10 and it still was fun. And I've feel like that, you know, 20 to 30, you know, it depends on your army, but just only having that kind of medium size for games really does put Blood and Plunder kind of ahead of a lot of other games, because a lot of other games run into one of two problems. The first thing that they might run into is that the army is really, really large and bulky, and this is when you start getting into a lot of these games that have uh, groups of miniatures on bases, these rank and flank games, which are fun, don't get me wrong, but having so many models means that you lose a lot of the tactical flexibility of choosing when your models are in cover or not, and it also means that you have a lot of models to paint. Or, alternately, the historical war game can have the other problem, which is that you only have a very small number of models, maybe like you know, five or six maximum. And for a lot of people, that just doesn't have the same visceral feeling of, I've got a lot of models that I'm putting down on the table. A lot of people don't like the, you know, skirmish kinds of combat games that have, you know, each model is an independent operative. I think the plethora of army style games kind of proves that Army style games are, if not more popular, at least more visible to, you know, people who are interested in wargaming. Now, on the other hand, some people don't like big army games that have a slew of models. You just have to spend a lot of time moving them, and it's just taking a long time. Blood and Plunder doesn't have any of those issues. It's both reasonably sized, but you can still put a good number of models on the table while keeping that reasonable pace of play. The second thing I want to talk about is theme. Or rather, being thematic? I feel a lot like there are two kinds of miniature wargamers. Uh, miniature wargamers who really like the gameplay, and then miniature wargamers who really like the hobby. And you can kind of move between those, and you can be in the middle, where you really like to play the game, but you also really like the hobby. But I feel like most people trend towards one of those two things more than the other. Now, some people really love building really competitive lists. They like really competitive armies, really competitive forces. They like the power gaming aspect. And then there are other people who, when they build an army or a force or a warband, they're really focused on the story and the lore and the theme and the fluff. And Blood and Plunder is great for that. Because Blood and Plunder is a historical miniatures game that takes place during the Age of Sail, the Age of Piracy, this age of kind of imperialistic expansion, you have a lot of background to choose from. You could make up your own pirate crew, or you could mirror the pirate crew from actual history. So, you know, there's a lot of options for creating the story, the theme, the fluff of your force. On the other hand, 
you can power game if you want. But here's the thing. The fluff and the power gaming are not mutually exclusive in Blood and Plunder. Now, granted, it's not technically mutually exclusive in any game. You can absolutely create backstories for all your stuff if you have a really powerful competitive army. But a lot of games, if you want to include one specific unit because it's thematic, that might tank your list in terms of how competitive it is. Blood and Plunder doesn't really do that. Every unit kind of has a place. Every ship kind of has a place. There, There's very little in Blood and Plunder that seems to serve no purpose. I've had instances where a unit that I thought, well, this is just kind of a, a unit I'm including for a theme, it's not going to do very good. I think a, a great example for this for me is the Sharpshooter. I didn't think the Sharpshooter was going to be useful, but it fit in with the theme of my army, and it actually ended up being really good. So Blood and Plunder is kind of this all-in-one experience of you can create this fluffy thematic army or force or pirate crew or whatever, but you can still make it really good within the rules because anything you want to put in your force, it'll probably work out. And because Firelock Games has done such a good job in making the game historically accurate, things are very thematic to begin with. The third thing I want to talk about is creative input of the consumer, which is a fancy way of saying you can paint your miniatures however you want. With most miniatures games, you can paint your guys however you want, but with most historical miniatures games, there's this kind of expectation that you will paint them according to how they looked in history. If you're painting a Napoleonic era soldier, they're going to look like what they were supposed to wear in that army. You know, if you're playing something in the American Revolutionary War and you have a British soldier, you're probably not going to paint his uniform bright green because that would look weird. But Blood and Plunder, because it takes place in this time when most armies didn't have standardized uniforms, and if you were a pirate or a buccaneer or something, you certainly didn't have a standardized uniform. Outside of perhaps the historical, like, legendary commanders that are based off of real people, which those you might want to paint a certain way, pretty much everything you can just paint however you want. In the box art for all the miniatures, Firelock Games has generally shown like, okay, all the filibustiers are wearing blue and gray or something like that. But that's really to distinguish that these guys all belong to a single unit. You, you don't have to do that. In fact, it's more historically accurate if you don't do that. As a result, being historically accurate in Blood and Plunder means that you have all the creative freedom in the world. You have more creative freedom in Blood and Plunder than any other game by being historically accurate. For me, I painted up all my pirates and no two of them are alike. Does that make it hard to determine what guy goes to what unit? <laughs> no. In all seriousness, though, I probably should have given him some, like, little arm markings or something to distinguish, but I like them the way they are. And that's really it. Three reasons why I think Blood and Plunder kind of goes above and beyond all other historical miniatures games. And really, my opinion is just going to become more extreme in that Blood and Plunder is the best historical miniatures game once Raise the Black releases. I am so excited for Raise the Black. It, right when I got into Blood and Plunder, I thought, you know what I want? I want Steve Bonnet. I want Jack Rackham. You know, I want all of these people. I want, because I knew I wanted to play Pirates, and I wanted all of this stuff from kind of this specific era of piracy, and we're getting it. So I'm going to end this with a special plea to Firelock Games. Please, please, please make a plastic sixth-rate frigate. The thing is, I'm getting Blackbeard. I have Blackbeard, so we have to have a Queen Anne's Revenge. So I would love it if you guys could make a plastic kit 
to where we could model our own Queen Anne's Revenge and make it look like the Queen Anne's Revenge, because that would be fantastic. Firelock Games, if you make a plastic six-rate frigate kit, I will personally buy at least two of them, because the six-rate frigate is just such a cool ship, and I don't own any yet. Also, Firelock Games, your resin ships, they're awesome, but they're, they're expensive, so a plastic kit would be really nice. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. If you want to hear more about my thoughts of Blood and Plunder, be sure to check out the Should You Play Blood and Plunder video, which I'll probably put right up there, around there-ish. Do you agree with what I've said? Do you disagree with what I've said? Do you think there's a historical miniatures game that's better than Blood and Plunder? Or do you, like me, think that Blood and Plunder might be at the very top? If you think any of these things, or if you think anything else, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the little bell icon, ding. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.